Welcome to the online lecture for Young Goodman Brown by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Part 1. Story Background Nathaniel Hawthorne was born in 1804 in Salem, Massachusetts, a village still permeated by 17th century Puritanism. Now, if you think of Salem Village in terms of early American history, you probably think of the Salem Witch Trials. Those took place over a hundred years before Hawthorne was born, but they're going to figure largely into the story that we'll read today. The story has a historical setting, with the drama placed into the colony's first century and not during the time when Hawthorne lived. When Hawthorne was four, his father died, and from that point on, he was surrounded mostly by women. Two sisters, a maiden aunt, and a retiring mother who was not particularly close to her children. As he grew up, he had little contact with his deceased father's family. He was the first in his family to go to college, and while there he made connections with other writers and other men his age, friends that he would keep his entire life. He's in college for four years, and after he returns home having graduated, he presents pretty much every parent's nightmare. He decides that he wants to move back home for 12 years. During those 12 years, he lives in his mother's attic. He tries to teach himself how to become a writer. There's no schools at that time that would teach people how to write fiction. There would have been some courses offered over in England, but in America, these types of um, classes haven't yet arrived. And so he's reading material from overseas. He's trying to get a sense of how language and literature is working in England through things that he's picking up at bookstores and the library. He's also trying to teach himself about American history because he sees American history as an interesting tableau in which to set his own stories. During this time, he does significant research about local New England history. This is the research that's going to inform our story, Young Goodman Brown, also other things that Hawthorne will write. All his life, he has assumed his father's family to be farmers or seafaring men. While doing research, he's surprised to find that his father's family is actually filled with illustrious colony founders as well as political and religious Puritan leaders of Salem. What he learns shocks him. Like others of his generation, he had embraced the popular belief that Puritans were basically peaceful religious pilgrims who sought to live in harmony with other groups. What he finds is evidence that the Puritans were individuals who forced their will to establish political dominance in the region. Specifically, what he learns is that the Puritans repeatedly persecuted another Protestant group in the area called the Quakers. There are significant areas of theological overlap between the Quakers and the Puritans. Both believe in the Old and New Testaments as inspired text. Both believe in the Trinity. Both believe in redemption of man through divine salvation. The theological differences, at least according to Hawthorne, are minimal. The Puritans were Calvinists in their theology and believed in a harsh, judgmental God. The Puritans embraced predestination and rejected free will. The Puritans read the Bible with a narrow interpretation and supported a paid professional clergy. The Puritans viewed people as individuals hopelessly sinful and unable to do good without divine intervention. This is known as the doctrine of total depravity. The Quaker, on the other hand, See God as a spirit who lives within the heart of every human being and offers them direct personal guidance. Because the Quakers see God more as a spirit, they see personal direction from God as being equally authoritative, if not more so, than religious scripture. Quakers sought to live in peace with everyone, including the Native Americans and Puritans, and practice religious toleration in their communities. For the Quakers, there were no paid clergy, but instead ministry was open to anyone, male or female, who felt led to speak at a meeting for worship. The Puritans believed that the Quakers, along with Catholics and Lutherans, were heretics. The Puritans had painstakingly spent years establishing a system of church government called the New England Way that was based on independence and power of the individual congregations. They resented other views of Christianity that were entering their territory, particularly in Massachusetts. Hawthorne saw these battles between the Puritans and the Quakers not as a quest for religious purity, but more simply as a quest for regional power. The question that initially frames young Goodman Brown is a social question similar to the one that initially begins Rip Van Winkle. Hawthorne is, in essence, 
contextualizing his argument. The question might go like this. You have heard that the Puritans were good-natured religious questers, but now consider the story that I'm about to tell you. Here is historical information presented as fiction designed to inform. The First Scene As with Rip Van Winkle, we don't have an original story in Young Goodman Brown. Anyone who's seen a horror movie will immediately recognize the setup. Goodman Brown is going out into the woods where the spirits live when his wife warns him not to go because she has a bad feeling about this. Though we as readers don't have complete information on Goodman Brown's motivation, we know that he plans to meet the Traveler, who is usually interpreted as the Devil, at an arranged time, perhaps because he's curious about the dark forces that may or may not inhabit the Earth. And just like any good blues song, Goodman is going to meet the Devil at the crossroads. As with Rip Van Winkle, the story doesn't yet explore the central character's motivation. Why does Goodman want to meet the devil? What does Goodman hope to gain out of this trip? We simply don't know. We only understand that he is a good man. He is hopelessly naive. He believes what he's been told and apparently lacks the philosophical depth to view the world as anything other than all good or all evil. But with this, the story makes some significant advances in the development of fiction as an art form. In Young Goodman Brown, we have full scenes with concrete detail. The story employs steady pacing with an eye toward dramatic escalation. The story also develops literary themes, even if those themes admittedly are a little loud inside the story. For example, Goodman Brown's wife, her name is Faith, a name that carries an obvious double meaning. At the end of the story, Goodman Brown loses two types of faith. He loses an important aspect of his marriage, and he also loses his religious beliefs. But perhaps the most important thing to note at the beginning of the story is that there's no trickery. The story doesn't come out and say that this is an old urban legend. The story doesn't say that this is a collection of letters or a diary. The story makes no claims towards truth. This is simply a work of fiction. The story is published in 1835. Rip Van Winkle was published in 1819. In the intervening 16 years, it seems that the American population has decided that it likes fiction. It was originally tricked into reading fiction, but by the time we get up to Hawthorne, people have seen that, well, maybe there are some advantages to reading fiction, to engaging things that aren't true. It took a bit of trickery to get people to this place, but once they are there, they can see the value in this new art form. They no longer need to be persuaded to read it. They have found a certain amount of joy or enlightenment in the engagement of fiction. Here is the first scene in Young Goodman Brown. Young Goodman Brown came forth at sunset into the street at Salem Village, but put his head back after crossing the threshold to exchange a parting kiss with his young wife. And Faith, as the wife was aptly named, thrust her own pretty head into the street, letting the wind play with the pink ribbons of her cap while she called to Goodman Brown. "'Dearest heart,' whispered she, softly and rather sadly when her lips were close to his ear, "'prithee put off your journey until sunrise and sleep in your own bed tonight.' A lone woman is troubled with such dreams and such thoughts that she's afeard of herself sometimes. Pray, tarry with me this night, dear husband, of all nights in the year. My love and my faith, replied young Goodman Brown, of all nights in the year, this one night must I tarry away from thee. My journey, as thou callest it forth and back again, must needs be done twixt now and sunrise. What, my sweet pretty wife, dost thou doubt me already, and we but three months married? Then God bless you, said Faith with the pink ribbons, and may you find all well when you come back. Amen, cried Goodman Brown. Say thy prayers, dear Faith, and go to bed at dusk, and no harm will come to thee. So they parted, 
and the young man pursued his way until, being about to turn the corner by the meeting-house, he looked back and saw the head of Faith still peeping after him with a melancholy air, in spite of her pink ribbons. In ways, the devil will function in part as Hawthorne's mouthpiece. The devil will deliver to the naive Goodman Brown the truth of Hawthorne's research. The devil's message is that people are duplicitous. It is as though the devil says, Goodman, you are too simple to understand that people have two faces. They wear one mask in the daytime to enhance their social respectability and another at night which reveals their true desires. Good men, the devil suggests. You have only seen people's false faces. You know nothing of their hearts. But I will explain it to you tonight. Let us walk on nevertheless, reasoning as we go, and if I convince thee not, thou shalt turn back. We are but a little way in the forest yet. Too far, too far, exclaimed the goodman, unconsciously resuming his walk. My father never went into the woods on such an errand, nor his father before him. We have been a race of honest men and good Christians since the days of the martyrs, and shall I be the first of the name of Brown that ever took this path and kept such company, thou wouldst say, observed the elder person, interpreting his pause. Well said, Goodman Brown. I have been as well acquainted with your family as with ever a one among the Puritans, and that's no trifle to say. I helped your grandfather, the constable, when he lashed the Quaker woman so smartly through the streets of Salem, and it was I that brought your father a pitch-pine knot, kindled at my own hearth to set fire to an Indian village in King Philip's war. They were my good friends both, and many a pleasant walk have we had along this path, and returned merrily after midnight. I would fain be friends with you for their sake. If it be as thou sayest, replied Goodman Brown, I marvel they never spoke of these matters, or verily I marvel not, seeing that the least rumor of the sort would have driven them from New England. We are a people of prayer, and good works to boot, and abide no such wickedness. Wickedness or not, said the traveller with the twisted staff, I have a very general acquaintance here in New England. The deacons of many a church have drunk the communion wine with me. The selectmen of diverse towns make me their chairman, and a majority of the great and general court are firm supporters of my interest, the governor and I too. But these are state secrets. With this, the devil's poison has entered Goodman's system. He is naive and believes what he's told. Once the devil explains that people are, by nature, evil, Goodman Brown begins to see them as evil. This is, in essence, the Puritan doctrine of total depravity. The doctrine states that after the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, people took on a sinful nature. That is, they were drawn to evil more than they were to good, and were unable to do good works without the intervention of God. Once Goodman has this doctrine, he becomes suspicious of others and wary of their motives. He has been told that people are duplicitous. Now he believes it. When other town people begin to appear in the woods, Goodman suspects the worst of them. When he sees his Sunday school teacher, Goody Close, he assumes that she is in the woods to hold fellowship with the devil. Through much of this section of the story, Goodman is hiding. He is afraid of being caught in the woods at night because he might be accused of being involved with witchcraft himself. Though the majority of people persecuted in Salem during the witch trials were women, men were also convicted and executed. You can best see how Goodman's thought process has changed when he sees two men approach on horseback. Goodman hides in some trees so he's not caught. Because of this, he can't see either the riders or their horses. Horses back in Goodman's day would kind of be 
his version of cars. You probably recognize your friends simply by their cars. If you see a car parked out in front of a restaurant, you know one of your friends is inside. Horses would be as easily identifiable to Goodman Brown. He would know his friends by the appearance of their horses. He can't see either of them, the people or their horses, so he has no means of visual recognition, but he assumes the worst about people that he sees. Here is how it works. On came the hoof tramps and the voices of the riders, two grave old voices conversing soberly as they drew near. These mingled sounds appeared to pass along the road within a few yards of the young man's hiding place, but owing doubtless to the depth of the gloom at this particular spot, neither the travelers nor their steeds were visible. Though their figures brushed the small boughs by the wayside, it could not be seen that they intercepted, even for a moment, the faint gleam of the strip of bright light athwart which they must have passed. Let's stop there for a second. Goodman Brown can't see them. They aren't in the moonlight. They aren't in shadows. The branches are in his way. He can only hear them. Goodman Brown alternatively crouched and stood on tiptoe, pulling aside the branches and thrusting forth his head as far as he dares, without discerning so much as a shadow. It vexed him the more because he could have sworn, were such a thing possible, that he recognized the voice of the minister and Deacon Gookin, jogging along quietly, as they were wont to do when bound to some ordination or ecclesiastical council, within hearing of one of the writers stop to pluck a switch. Okay, let's stop there again. Here's what's going on. He hears people, he doesn't recognize them, he can't see them. His mind goes to the worst possible option. He thinks that these are people from his church that are now out in the woods about evil. The framework of his mind has changed. The doctrine of total depravity has changed how he views those around him. He now distrusts them. A little bit more from that same scene. Of the true reverend, sir, said the voice like the deacons. Okay, the story doesn't say said the deacons. This is how Goodman's processing it. He says there's a voice, and now to him it sounds like the deacon's voice. This is not yet the deacon. We're just hearing how Goodman is processing this information. Of the two, reverend sir, said the voice like the deacons, I'd rather miss an ordination dinner than tonight's meeting. They tell me that some of our community are to be here from Falmouth and beyond, and others from Connecticut and Rhode Island, besides several of the Indian powwows, who after their own fashion know almost as much deviltry as the best of us. Moreover, there is a goodly young woman to be taken into communion. Here's how Goodman's mind's working. He's been told that people have two faces. Now he sees this when he looks out at the world. The philosophy has changed how he interacts with his social environment. The four blazing pines threw up a loftier flame and obscurely discovered shapes and visages of horror on the smoke wreaths above the impious assembly. At the same moment, the fire on the rock shot redly forth and formed a glowing arch above its base, where now appeared a figure. The high point of the story is set at a witch meeting in the woods, where Goodman sees his wife Faith taken into the devil's communion. Now, I should point out that the story gives us three possible ways to interpret the reality of the scene. Here's the first possibility. In the world of the story, this event happens as it's narrated. Goodman is freaked out because these things happened. Possibility number two. The story posits this question as a possibility. This quote comes from the near end of the story. Quote, Had Goodman Brown fallen asleep in the forest and only dreamed a wild dream of a witch meeting? End quote. Maybe the meeting doesn't happen at all. Maybe the story is only narrating Goodman's hallucination. Or to put this in the vernacular of the 21st century, the vivid dream might be the product of Goodman's religiously repressed consciousness. Possibility number three. The story also posits this as a possibility. 
that Goodman's vision was inspired by the generally spooky sounds and sights of the forest at night, along with probably a large serving of local witch lore. Here's where this idea is placed into the story. Quote, the next moment, so indistinct were the sounds, he doubted whether he had heard aught, that is, whether he had heard anything, whether he had heard aught but the murmur of the old forest whispering without a wind. So there's the ways that this might be placed into the reality of the story. It happens, it's a dream, or it's kind of a, a lucid dream inspired by the sounds and sights of the forest at night. But regardless, as to the objective fictional reality of these events, Goodman believes that the witch meeting actually happened, even if it was only a dream. The message of the devil, then, about the sinful nature of humanity, is one Goodman immediately takes to heart. He doesn't have the intellectual tools to challenge it. Furthermore, this message must feel real to Goodman. Certainly the message strikes a note of truth with the author, Nathaniel Hawthorne, as well. Welcome, my children, said the dark figure, to the communion of your race. Ye have found thus young your nature and your destiny. My children, look behind you. They turned, and flashing forth as it were in a sheet of flame, the fiend worshippers were seen, the smile of welcome gleamed darkly on every visage. There, resumed the sable form, are all whom ye have reverenced from youth. Ye deemed them holier than yourselves, and shrank from your own sin, contrasting it with their lives of righteousness and prayerful aspirations heavenward. Yet here are they all in my worshipping assembly. This night, it shall be granted you to know their secret deeds, how hoary bearded elders of the church have whispered wanton words to the young maids of their households, how many a woman, eager for widow's weeds, has given her husband a drink at bedtime and let him sleep his last sleep in her bosom. How beardless youths have made haste to inherit their father's wealth, and how fair damsels, blush not sweet ones, have dug little graves in the carter and bidden me, the sole guest, to an infant's funeral. By the sympathy of your human hearts for sin, ye shall scent out all the places, whether in church, bedchamber, street, field, or forest, where crime has been committed, and shall exult to behold the whole earth one stain of guilt, one mighty blood spot. Far more than this, it shall be yours to penetrate in every bosom the deep mystery of sin, the fountain of all wicked arts, and which inexhaustibly supplies more evil impulses than human power, than my power at its utmost, can make manifest in deeds. And now, my children, look upon each other. From here, Goodman returns to Salem irrevocably changed. Now believing that people are duplicitous, that they wear two masks, he is generally untrusting of others in town. He withdraws from his marriage. Though he continues to attend church, his simple faith is gone. In the end, this story, much like Rip Van Winkle, seems designed to engender discussion. Hawthorne, in effect, starts a discussion by saying, You may have heard that the Puritans were mainly religious individuals seeking peace and refuge from Europe. But here, look into this story to discover the historic, though poorly remembered, actions of some Puritans. This story also seems to be indicting the Puritans themselves. Hawthorne is suggesting that if the Puritans actually believed in the doctrine of total depravity, they would end up as untrusting social recluses, much like Goodman Brown himself. But because the Puritans were generally social both within and without their religious community, Hawthorne is suggesting that likely they don't fully believe their own doctrines. That is, their public actions do not match what Hawthorne sees 
as the likely outcome of their beliefs. Hawthorne is deeply influenced by the culture of nonfiction. His fiction delivers information and engages readers in an argument. This concept of fiction is very different than that of other early American fiction writers, such as Edgar Allan Poe, who sought to attach fiction not to the traditions of nonfiction, but rather to attach it to the traditions of poetry. But that is for another class.